Last Sunday, I introduced this year's theme, that's 2021, Be Strong and Courageous, and it's taken from the book of Joshua, chapter 1 and verse 9. These are the words that God himself spoke to Joshua during a very difficult and yet a, a defining moment in Joshua's life. It is what will make or break for Joshua. At his age of 83 years old, this word that came to him will either cause him to cross over to the promised land or die in the wilderness like the rest of his generation. And so God says, have I not commanded you be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you, you go. We know that at this point, Joshua is standing at the banks of the swollen Jordan River, which separates him from the promised land. And he also knows that the Canaanites dwell in the land that has been allotted to them by the Lord. And so the Jordan River and the, uh, and the Canaanites stood in the way. They stood between Joshua and his inheritance, or the Israelites, and their inheritance, an inheritance that was long promised to their forefathers. This is the very reason why they left Egypt. When they left Egypt, they left Egypt knowing they are going to the land that was promised to their forefathers, a place of their own, a place given to, to them by God. Joshua needed to trust in the Lord is God, believe in God's promises, take courage, rise up and move forward, enter that land and dispossess the occupants of their possession. Of course, you know that they will not take it lying down. They will resist. They will fight back. But Joshua needed to count on God's help and God's presence because God promised him that he was going to be with him wherever he went. Of course, as you read the rest of the book of Joshua, you will find out that Joshua not only acted on that word that God gave him, but also time to time Joshua himself will speak to his people and tell them, be strong and courageous. The very word he had received from God, he will tell it to the people along the way as they conquered the land of Canaan. So Joshua crossed over. He conquered the land and they divided it among the Israelites. Praise be the name of the Lord. The word of God came through the timid, fearful Joshua. Having received the word of God and acted upon it, counting on the presence of God and the promises of God, entered the Canaan, Canaan land, conquered it and divided, um, divided it among the Israelites. At the end of the book of Joshua, in Joshua chapter 24, verse 29, we read these words. And it came to pass after these things that Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died being 110 years old. I don't know if you see the change of titles. When we met him at the beginning of Joshua chapter 1 verse 1, he was Joshua, the servant or the assistant of Moses, the servant of the Lord. But after heeding to the word of the Lord and taking courage and acting on it, Joshua qualifies to be called the servant of the Lord. Hallelujah. So he finishes the journey being the servant of the Lord. I want to speak to you who feels weak and timid and you look at other people, you feel they are better than you, they are more anointed than you, they have more than you do. I want to tell you that you need to hear the word of God and act upon that word. It will transform you and translocate you from being a weak, feeble, fearful person to becoming a mighty man, a mighty woman of God. God plays no favorites, people of God. If he could do it for me, he can do it for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Someday when God gives me permission, I will give you my testimony in detail because many of you may not know. But to metoka mbali. So Joshua is no longer referred to as the servant of Moses. Joshua becomes God's servant. By his life of courage, by obedience to the word of God, by the exploits he carries out, he earned himself the right to be called the servant of the Lord. 
Hallelujah. So then today, we are saying these words that were spoken to Joshua, who was entering a real, a literal canon, who had literal enemies, are being spoken to us in the 21st century in the Bamburi church. What does it mean in our context? We have no literal Jordan to cross. We have no literal land to be dispossessed. What enemy could we be facing? What strength is he talking about? And how exactly should we go about getting strong? Maybe that's what we're asking ourselves. What does it mean? And many times we don't understand what God really means. If we don't receive the revelation of what God is speaking to us, we can easily miss out. You can prepare strength in a different direction. You will think God wants you to have muscles and so you will eat a lot of ugali. Only to find your muscles are not helping. When I saw a few so we need to understand what kind of warfare, what kind of battle, what kind of hindrances, what is it that we need to fight with in order for us to be able to prepare properly. So come with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 6. We are going to read Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 to 18. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. That word be strong. Okay? It is in the New Testament. That means it is written to the believers, me and you. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having guarded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shot your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful, to this end, we all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Praise the name of our Lord. Now, this is going to, to be the basis of our discussion in the next few weeks. I came to understand that there is a pastor who was doing an exposition of this particular portion of scriptures. And out of it, he preached 28 sermons in a row from just that portion of scripture. So I don't know how many. And another one wrote a book that is 1,200 pages from that portion of scripture. So I don't know how long we shall be here. But I, I pray that you don't miss because I believe I feel in my intestines it's going to be exciting. I pray that your heart will be open and receptive, that you will be ready to be moved to the next level. I want to begin. You see, you know what Paul says finally. So of course that means there is something that he has been talking about. So I want to begin by letting you know that the book of Ephesians is a letter that was written by Paul while he was in prison. And it was written to the saints who were in the city of Ephesus. A city that was so idolatrous. A city that had the temple, the magnificent big temple of Diana. A city that had idol worship. And he writes to the saints. If you want to know more about that story, you can go back to the book of Acts chapter 19 and see Paul's encounter with the Ephesians um, and how he established the church or strengthened the church in Ephesus. And so, but this is 
the letter that Paul is writing to them while he's in prison. And they deals with very pertinent issues in the life of a believer. The core issues of what means what it means to be a Christian. Actually, the book of Ephesians is called the believer's handbook. That if you only had the letter of a vision and you live in an island somewhere or you live in the wilderness somewhere with just the Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, you will be having the entire gospel. You will be having all that God wants you to have. And that book, he has divided it into three key sections. I am explaining why Paul says finally, so you need to know he's coming from somewhere. In section one, he discusses the position and the wealth of the believer. That is from chapter one to chapter three. Paul discusses the position and the wealth of the believer. That's where he tells us we are seated in the heavenlies with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where he says what we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul begins there in verse 3 of chapter 1 by saying that we are blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you believe that as the word of God? That as a child of the Lord, if you have come to know Christ as Lord and Savior, you have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. Because of your union with the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no blessing that God has not given you. You are blessed with every spiritual blessing. Your union with Christ gives you, it's like you have been made a coined, a, a co, uh, joint, a joint, a joint um, holder, or what you call account, account. When you have a joint account, and you have the liberty to withdraw. There are some people, there are some spouses who trust their spouses. And they make them, yeah, they, they, they joint account. They put them in their name. The woman may not be working as a housewife. That's in the end. I have seen this with my sister in Nairobi. Okay, she works, but her job was not as good as the husband's. But she was made, uh, uh, here, here. A signatory and a, a joint account. They had a joint account with their husband. And my sister operated the account. Yeah, she had access. And she would withdraw. And she will, of course, somebody has to trust you to do that. Okay? And so that's what the Bible says. What are these blessings? As you read from chapter 1 to chapter 3 of the book of Ephesians, you will see the blessings. And I will go over them quickly. Paul says we are chosen in Christ to be holy and blameless before God. We are chosen in Christ. It is in our union with Christ that God chooses us to be holy and blameless before God. That's in verse 4. In verse 5 he says we are adopted as sons. We have been adopted into the family of God. That even us who are women in the family of God, we are sons. And you know sons get inheritance. We are adopted as sons. And in verse 6, we are accepted in Christ. Hallelujah. We are accepted in Christ. God has accepted us. As long as we are united in Christ, he has accepted us in Christ. And then number seven, he says, we have been redeemed through the blood of Jesus Christ. He has redeemed us. He has brought us back from slavery, from bondage, from the kingdom of darkness. He has redeemed us. As many of us as are united with Christ, we have been redeemed. And then verse seven again, he says, we are forgiven. Hallelujah. We are forgiven. And then verse 11, he says, we are predestined to be heirs. Warithi pamocha na Christo. Those are the many blessings that we have been blessed with in the heavenlies. And then number 13, he says, we are, verse 13 of chapter 1, he says, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. We are sealed. God has sealed us. And the Holy Spirit is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. 
He has sealed us. And all those who have experienced this blessing of the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ, the Bible, Paul says that all of us individually, we have these blessings in the heavenly realms as we come to, to faith, as we get united with the Lord Jesus Christ. And then all of us together, the Bible says, uh, Paul is teaching us in chapter 3, he says, he reveals to us the mystery, that which God has been working from time immemorial, that he was preparing a people, that all of those who have experienced this blessing of the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ are united together to form one body, which is called the church. Meaning, the church is not a building. The church is you and you and you and you individuals who have come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ, who are united with Christ, and then together we become the church, which is the body of Christ, with Christ being the head of that body, and each one of us being members of that body. And Paul reveals to us in chapter 3 that the reason why God has done this it is a plan that he began from the Garden of Eden after the fall. The reason why he has united us together to form a body of the Lord Jesus Christ, people who have experienced the grace of God, the blessing of the grace of God, is that God has designed the church to dispense Christ's fullness everywhere. May the Lord help you to catch that. That God... God's design is that as the body of Christ, all of us united together having experienced these blessings of God, we will be able to dispense the Christ's fullness everywhere. Ministering as a living body, spreading over the earth and the penetrating the heavenlies. That is the first section. That's what Paul discusses in the first section, which is chapter 1 to chapter 3. In chapter, the second section, Paul discusses the believer's walk or practice, which is from chapter 4 to chapter 6, verse 9. Church, are you following me? The believer's walk. First, we talked about the, the believer's position and wealth. Now, Paul moves on to discuss the believer's walk or practice. The believers practice or walk. In this section, Paul wants us to understand how this glory of God's grace and the presence must affect our everyday living. This privileged position in Christ and the many resources that God has given to us must affect our everyday life. Can I hear an amen from the, from the church? It must affect how we walk. It must affect how we live. So in this particular section from chapter 4, Paul calls on us as believers to walk worthy of the calling because we have been called by God. That is in verse 1 of chapter 4. He says, walk worthy of the calling with which God has called you. Please tell your neighbor for me. Indeed, kabisa kama umeitu na mungu, na kama kabisa umeungana na kristo, if truly you have come to know Christ as Lord and Savior, the calling to all of us in this decade, limitless decade, we must walk worthy of the call that we have received. Can I hear an amen from the saints? He says, this walking worthy, he says, number one, because we are the body of Christ in the church and we are diverse, we are different, we have come from different backgrounds, we are different age groups, we are different characters, we are, we are so different. He said, among us the believers as Christians, as the body of Christ, we must walk in unity. Amen. We must walk in unity, understanding that we are different. We have different giftings. 
We have different characters, different temperaments. We are all unique and different. But our salvation, in the, our salvation and our unity with the Lord Jesus Christ has made us one. And so in our diversity, we must walk in unity. Hallelujah. And he says we must walk in purity. That's from verse 17 to 32. He says we are not only going, to our position and the resources we have in Christ must affect our work. It must result in the unity among us in the church. We can have unity in our diversity. We don't have, we don't have to have uniformity to have unity. We can have unity in our diversity. And so he says we must walk in purity. Purity, being pure, being holy, walking, living holy lives. Speak the truth. He says, speak the truth in, in love. He says, in your anger, do not sin. Do not steal. Speak gracefully to one another. Be tender-hearted. Put away all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking, all malice. Be tender-hearted. Forgive one another. Hallelujah. That's work. In purity. Live a pure life. Live a holy life. And then he says walk in love. Chapter 5 verse 1 to 7. Walk in love. Walk in the light. Do not walk in the darkness. That is verse 8 to 14. Walk in the light. And then he says walk in wisdom. Chapter 5 verse 15 to 21. Walk in wisdom. Actually, what he's saying here, Paul, is that walk in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Walk in the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of your flesh. Seek to be guided, to live daily, to be led by the Holy Spirit of God. And in chapter 5, verse 21, he says that our position in Christ and the resources that we have received from God, the blessings we have in the heavenlies should affect our work in such a way that we live a life that we are submitted one to another. We submit one to another in the fear of God. Hallelujah. And he says this, when we do so, if we are going if our position in Christ and the resources we have received from Christ, if they are going to affect our personal work, our individual work as individuals, if it affects us positively, if we are going to walk in the fullness of the Holy Spirit, it will affect how we relate with one another. It will affect our relationships. Wives who know their position in Christ and are walking worthy of their calling, will submit to their own husbands as unto the Lord. Can I hear an amen from other sisters? Amen. And then he says, husbands, likewise, who have, who know their position in Christ and are walking worthy of their calling, will love their own wives as Christ loved the church. I want you to picture that church. I want you to picture a church where wives Submit to their own husbands as unto the Lord. Husbands love their wives as Christ loves the church. Children, they are obedient to their parents in the Lord. Parents are not provoking their children, but they are training them and admonishing them and training them in the fear of the Lord. Then those who are employees, they are serving in their employment Serving their masters, not because the master is watching over them, but they are doing so knowing they are serving God even in their jobs. Hallelujah. And then employers also, knowing that they have a master in heaven, they are not intimidating and they are not oppressing uh, uh, the workers. They are treating them knowing they are co-heirs with them in the kingdom of God. Can you imagine that society? How does that look? That is heaven on earth. That is the kingdom of God. Which is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. This is when our every 
day-to-day walk as believers is aligned with our position in Christ, resulting in orderly relationships, then we will have the spiritual power to dispense Christ's fullness everywhere. Ministering as a living body, spreading over the earth and penetrating the heavenlies. That is in essence what Paul is saying. We have been called, we have a mission. We have work to do to spread the kingdom of Christ, to spread or to, uh, to bring the fullness of Christ into the whole earth, to dispense it so that wherever we are, people can see Christ. We take Christ to the office, take Christ in our homes. We are with Christ in the market. We, have, we dispense Christ. You understand a dispenser? You become a dispenser for Christ. But you cannot dispense Christ if your position is not secure, if you don't understand the resources you have, and if your work is not aligned to the call. And I think, church, if we are honest with one another, that's where the church has lost her power to influence. True or false? That's, we, we know we are children of God. We know we have been saved. But when it comes to the work, to Nachanganya Migu, and then the world is not able to see Christ. We are not able to dispense, we are not able to be bold to declare, to dispense Christ. So this is the one thing Paul prayed over and over again, that the believer will fully understand the magnitude of what he has been called into and the resources available for him. That you read Paul's prayer for the Christian, for the believer, in Ephesians chapter 1, right from verse 18 down, I think verse 15 down to 18, he prays there that the believers will receive a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God. That the eyes of their hearts will be enlightened so that they understand their calling, they understand the resources available to them, that they may understand the power of God, God that is at work in the believer and that it is the same power that raised Christ from the dead. He prays, oh, that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened, that you will receive an understanding of who you are, what you have been called into, what has been given into you, if you understood the resources you had. Paul is saying, you are there, you have a K, K what? What is that gun? A pistol, you have a K? K for seven. It is fully loaded. And you stand there being intimidated by something small. He says, you have, you have what it takes. Just pull the trigger. Paul is saying, understand what is in your hands. And in chapter 3, he prays another prayer for the believer that they will be strengthened with might from the heavens. With God's might. That you will be strengthened with might in your inner man. Hallelujah. That you may know God's love for you. Paul prayed. Now we come to section 3. And that's what we just read. So now you understand where he's coming from when he says finally. In section 3, Paul discusses the believer's warfare. The warfare. Now you understand where we are. Paul is saying, finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord. He talks about the believer's warfare. In this section, kind of, Paul calls up us to arms. He calls us to action. He call, calls us to fight. He makes it so clear to us that believers we literally live on a war zone. We live on a war zone, people of God. And I, I know, I believe that lack of understanding that we live on a war zone 
we have slacked, we have slumbered and slept. And the enemy has had access into our homes, into our own personal lives first, into our relationships, into our homes, into our children, into our workplaces, because we slept. Or because we never fought back. We wanted to become good, gentle, humble people. Because in our understanding, humility is you don't even hurt a fly. So you find believers, even in their workplaces, being treated. Somebody was telling me, elder was saying, that even in the workplace, when there is a chance for promotion, and the people are asked to apply, the believer cannot apply because it will be a sign of pride. Kama mungu anataka nipate, that is foolishness. Lack of understanding that we live on a war zone. And so that's why Paul will say, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. When he says, finally, brethren, he is saying, in so far as the rest of life and its challenges are concerned, the whole church, as the body of Christ, must prepare for, to fight. Not just a few chosen, not just a, a, a few that are chosen to fight. As I'm a, hey, you learn a warrior. Prayer warrior, you learn. Paul is saying, finally, brethren, meaning Kilamtu. As a body of Christ together. Because we are as strong as our weakest link. It is not possible that one person can keep the enemy at bay when the rest of us are taking it easy. Saying, you ni biashara ya wale prayer warrior. He's calling the entire church as the body of Christ. He's saying, we must be fighters. We must be ready to fight. We must take action. But before I, I go into the actual fight, I want us to understand that when you prepare for any battle or for any war, you must know your enemy. That's why you see, even when our Kenyans are going to run and they know they are meeting Ethiopians, they study how they do their thing. And any army that is going to face another army for battle, they need intelligence. They need to know how that, who that enemy is, how they do their thing. And so Paul goes ahead to help us know our enemy. He says, know your enemy. It's indeed tragic, friends, to try to meet an enemy that you don't know. It is tragic to meet an enemy that you don't know. Because you will be ill-equipped to meet that enemy. So Paul tells us, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Please turn to your neighbor and tell them, you are not wrestling. Your enemy is not flesh and blood. The enemy is not a fellow human being. It is not your sister or your brother in the church. The enemy is not your husband or your wife. The enemy is not your colleague. And your enemy is not the neighbor who always is seeking a quarrel from you. He says you need to know your enemy. People of God, how often and how easily we are distracted and begin wrestling human adversaries. Instead of focusing our efforts on warring the invisible enemy behind the scenes. How many times have we seen brethren devote one another in the church? We have seen fights in the church, stones and knives and pangas in the church. Churches being locked and having factions or people fighting. And every time you look at it and say, oh, they missed the actual enemy. Oh, Pamburi Church, my church, I pray that God will help us. 
that at no time we will start devouring one another. Knowing that we have been purchased by the precious blood of Jesus Christ and we have been made one in him. Nobody fights against itself. And so he says you need to know that your enemy is not your sister. At this point, maybe I will share with you. When I joined, before I joined university, I had a cousin of mine who kept telling me he walk off ni high school staff. Ukufika kambas utahachana na wo pussy. And I prayed to God and I said, Lord, I pray you will give me grace and strength to stand for you in the university so that they may know that the God who saves in high school sustains through university. And so I went into campus with that nime chikaza. And I knew that the only remedy from the gates ni ku announce who I am in Christ. Bana iso sefewe. And so from the gate, whoever I met, I said, I am Flora, I'm born again, I love Jesus so much. And soon after, you know, when you are first year as freshers, in the, in the dining hall, young men will make jokes of me. And they will say, hey, have you seen a girl who is in love with Jesus? And that time we are lining up for food. And in my heart, in Likwani Mekangangari, Wakisema hivyo nasa, that's me. Yes, I said, I'm not going to be ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ. I said, that is me. And, brethren, it didn't take long before I faced the enemy. Because now the enemy did not come from non-believers. He went through the CU from the pulpit. But you need to understand that at this time, I was relating already with your bishop. <laughs> and he was working with Kamba's crusade, which is, um, which is an, a, a parachurch organization. And somebody who was working with a different parachurch organization that competes with, uh, with Kamba's crusade told people in the Kamba's that Kamba's crusade which is life ministry, is a cult. I don't know if you understand this. And so that person went and told the leadership of the church, because I didn't make my relationship, I didn't make it a secret. It was open. They say that girl is relating with a man who works with a cult. If she's allowed to mingle and mix with the rest of the believers, she will teach, she will take the believers into the cult. So the best thing, cut her off from the fellowship. And so that's what I went through for two years. Do you understand, people of God? And so when I went through that, of course, the pain that you are being ostracized, I will ask you, God, what sin have I committed that the church ostracizes me? And the cuts of people, including people I led to the Lord in the campus, they are told never to talk to me, never to come to my room, because I will teach them bad doctrine. And so I was alone and lonely. The only comfort or close people I had were my tribesmen, who were all of them none born again. And so, and I felt the pull to what's falling. It was so strong. I actually tried to change my, my uh, um, whatever, my course from Bachelor of Commerce. I wanted to go to Kenyatta University. I was in Nairobi University, Lower Kabete. So I wanted to go to uh, uh, Kenyatta and try to change to a different course so that I transfer and go elsewhere. It was not possible. So I was there and I felt the pull towards backsliding. And I remember one night in my room, I knelt down and I said, God, you must speak to me today. I feel strongly the pull towards falling, towards backsliding, the very thing that I said I wouldn't do in campus. And I said, Lord, instead of backsliding, kill me. I want to die. I will not dare live a backslidden life. 
Unless I want you to tell me what's going on. God is so gracious. That night in a dream, the Lord, the Lord revealed to me that it's a spiritual warfare. The enemy has asked for permission to shift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith will not completely fail. After you are strengthened, encourage the brethren. When I rose up that morning, after I understood what was going on in the spiritual realm, I became violent in the spirit. When I saw a few, I started going to the Christian Union by force. I'll go to their prayer meeting by force. In the name of Jesus. And I stopped looking at the brothers, you know, the leaders, the chairman. I stopped looking at them. I said, devil, I know it's not my brother. Now I understand it's not him. It is you, devil. And I started blessing God and praying for those brothers and the chairman and the leaders of the Christian Union. Blessing them and speaking life into them and telling devil, you can't catch me. But I just as if you were. To cut the long story short, after two years, brothers came to me to ask for forgiveness. And they asked me, how did you survive? When I was as if you were. By the grace of God. Brethren, we are not battling against flesh and blood. When you understand that, you will war properly. You will stop fighting a brother when you see that the enemy... Remember when Peter, when Peter came to Jesus to tell him, not to, to discourage him from moving forward, from going to the cross. Peter had just confessed great confession, saying you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus had told him, flesh and blood have not revealed it is to you, but my father in heaven. So everybody understood that Peter is a man that God reveals things to. The next time he speaks... It is not God's revelation. And Jesus discerned and said, get thee behind me, Satan. Next time I tell you that, please understand I have understood who is working behind you. The enemy of the believer is the devil, also known as Satan. Devil, the word devil means slanderer, accuser of brethren, while Satan means adversary or enemy. And he accomplished, his accomplishes is the flesh. That is the sinful nature in us. And the evil world system. The devil is real, people of God. The devil is real. He is a real person. He is a spirit person. The Bible says he has intelligence. In 2 Corinthians 11.3. He has emotions. Revelation 12.17. He has a will. In Isaiah 14. Verse 12 to 14. He can speak. Remember, I told Jesus, if you are a son of man, make this bread, in the, make this stone into bread. You will be stupid, you will be foolish to think the devil does not exist. And that's where many of us, okay, there are two extremes that as a child of God we must avoid. Extreme number one is to see the devil in everything. And to keep looking for him even in this leaf. Bona hii leaf hiko hivi. Naka shetani. Insi ikipita, pepo. Paka ikipita, pepo. That is another extreme where I pray. We don't get to that one. Because uki mutafuta shetani utampata, I tell you. When you look for the devil, you will find him. But if you look for God, you will also find him. You will always look, find what you're looking for. There are people who annoy me. Everything to them is shetani and ni people. Even a viral infection. Hello? Wanaona shetani, wanaona people. We are not going, we need not to talk about him every time. But another extreme is to, to deny his existence. Denying that he doesn't exist. That also is foolishness. Because Jesus himself talked about the devil and that he exists. Jesus acknowledged his existence. The Bible tells us in Ezekiel chapter 28 that he was created as an angel. 
And I thank God that the Bible says he was created. That means he's not equal with God because he's a created being. And being a created being, he has limits. Hallelujah. He is not omnipotent. That is, he's not all powerful. He's not omnipresent. He's not omniscient. He doesn't know everything. If he knew everything, he could not have allowed Jesus Christ to be crucified. So he doesn't know everything. He's not everywhere at the same time. The devil cannot be here and be in Mombasa in town at the same time. He's limited. He's not like our God. Of course, you will ask me, how come then there is so much evil everywhere around the world? I will come there. He was originally created and called Lucifer, meaning light bearer. The Lucifer is a good name. It means light bearer. But I'm not saying you go name your child Lucifer. You know, <laughs> you, know you come and tell me, oh, pastor, meet my son. He's Lucifer. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, uh, I will have difficulty dedicating Lucifer. I dedicate you. Uh, 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 uh. You know, but he fell from heaven because iniquity was found in him. That is pride, self-will. In Isaiah 14, 13 to 14, you will find, you will find uh, uh, the many eyes, the five eyes of, of Lucifer. He said, I will ascend into the heavens. I will be like the most high God. Iniquity was, sin was first found in Lucifer, who was an angel created by God. When Lucifer fell, he fell with many angels. He led rebellion in heaven. And those fallen angels are the ones that are referred to as demons. So the demons are the ones that the enemy, the devil, Lucifer himself, works with. They are the ones he has dispatched. That's why you will hear Daniel talking about the prince of the air in Persia. Do you understand? So the enemy, Satan, has divided the nations of the world, the world into principalities. He has divided it among his angels and put them in ranks. That there is an angel or there is a, a demon that is over Mombasa or over Kenya. He has the world, the devil is called the ruler of this world. In other words, the world is his kingdom. That's why Jesus says, you are in the world, but you are not of the world. You will see that in Luke 4, verse 5 and 6. Where the devil said to Jesus, all this authority I will give you and their glory. For this has been delivered to me and I give it to whoever I wish. So let me tell you, Christian. Child of God, we live in the world. This world is the devil's. It's the kingdom of the devil. The devil has established his kingdom in the world. And this happened when our first parents, Adam and Eve, who were given dominion over the earth, relinquished their authority, their dominion over the earth that God created and gave, and handed it, you know, gave it to them. When they handed it over to Satan because of his trickery, because of his deception, so Adam and his siblings or siblings or his children became captives in a world where they were supposed to, to have dominion. They became subjects. We were held hostage by the enemy who came through trickery, deceived our, four, uh, our first parents, led them to sin against God, and then he took over the earth. John 14, verse 30. Jesus himself says, I will no longer talk much with you for the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. I want you to have that understanding so that you know that when God in his wisdom sent Jesus Christ to die to redeem a people for himself and make them into a body called the church so that through the church he, they can dispense the fullness of Christ and establish the kingdom of Christ here on earth. So the church is to expand the kingdom of Christ on earth. Meaning we must push back 
the kingdom of Satan. We must uh, overthrow the rulership of Satan. And we are not going to do it at the go. It will be one person at a time. One person at a time. People of God, are you still here with me? Or did I lose you? And so we must know our enemy. We have a really enemy. And he's at work. He wants to keep as many people in darkness as possible. And God has put the church here. That we may push darkness away. And be able to cause many people to see the light of God. And they come into the kingdom of God. Another thing Paul is telling us is that we must not underestimate the power of our enemy. Do not underestimate. Yes, I've said it's not all powerful. But let me tell you, the devil is not your equal. Hello? It's not your match. It is Jesus who defeated him. It is God and Jesus who are more powerful. But not you. I have had people you know, feel as if me shetani I was going to Me shetani I was going to I have seen people do that, and uh, if you want to know, ask the sons of Skeva. They will tell you they went to cast a demon out of a man, saying, "In the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, come out." And the devil asked, "Who are you, Paul?" To Namujua. Na Yesu to Namujua. Where ni nani? They were beaten, stripped naked. They ran away naked. Ask them, they will tell you. So do not underestimate the power of your enemy. So many armies have been wiped out by underestimating their enemies. So Paul says we are coming up against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So the invisible enemy has clearly defined levels of authority. That's principalities, powers, and rulers. They have ranking and they are powerful. He says they are rulers of the darkness of this age. The host, spiritual hosts of wickedness. When you see all those that are going on around us in this generation in the world and you keep asking what on earth is going on in the world? Please understand that these rulers of darkness and this uh, host, a spiritual host of wickedness, they are the forces behind the pornography. They are the forces behind abortion. They are the forces behind rebellion, behind lies, behind sexual perversion, behind immoral, immorality, murder, greed, and every other wicked thing that you see. Paul says also, this enemy, they are cunning. First 11. He says we are to stand against the wiles of the devil. The word wiles means schemes, tricks. They are subtle. The devil does not come to you and tell you, hey, I am the devil. And I have come here today because I want to attack your marriage. Do you think he comes there with the horns? And then you meet him and say, I'm Mr. Devil. No. He says we have to be aware that he, he is so cunning. He has schemes. He has tricks. He has very subtle ways he comes in. Like doubting God's word. You know, a wrong belief system. Unfounded guilt. Undermining our faith in God's word. False religion and such a things. He comes in a very subtle way. Did God really say? Did God really mean? What does it mean? If you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you know that the Christian life is a battle. If you have not yet realized that, I want to suggest to you. If you are here listening to me, and you are wondering what I'm talking about, and you have never had any battle, you have never experienced any war with the forces of darkness. You, you, you don't know what... Uh, chances are you are not yet a believer. Yeah, that is the truth. You are not yet a believer. Because anybody who has come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, 
the opposition, the resistance, the evil you face will tell you that you have been enlisted to the Lord's army. The first time I gave my life to the Lord Jesus Christ, I was in high school. And the first warfare I faced was with the teachers and, and, the, and, the, teachers and, the, and the administrators of my school. You see, it was a Catholic school. And I got saved. I was newly born again. I, I just gave my life to the Lord. And then there was such a revival in that school, Mukumu Girls High School. There was a revival. Girls were getting saved and refusing to go to Catholic Mass and coming to the Christian Union gatherings. There was such a powerful move of the Spirit of God and salvation going on. And I was newly, I was one of those who was caught up in that wave and gave my life to the Lord. And before I know it, a few of us who are more focal in the Christian Union were called to the administrative office. And when we were called, I didn't know what we had done. But the administrative was incensed that we are turning girls from Catholic to Christian Union. And before we would say a thing, I had a slap that had me have a headache for a whole week. I had a bad slap that I had a headache for a whole week from my headmistress. But you know, we had read a word earlier. Blessed are you. You are counted worthy if you suffer for Christ. And so, we said with one another, with the, the girls we were with, let's not tell the believers what has happened. They will be scared. And so when we went in, just wanted to know how we are doing in the Christian Union. <laughs> so if you have been a believer, I have a short time you have become a believer and you have not experienced warfare, you need to examine where you are standing as far as your Christian life is concerned. A man by the name A.W. Dozer said that the Christian life is not a playground but a battlefield. As I've said earlier, the two dangers to avoid is always talking about the devil and looking for him everywhere and also denying his existence. People of God, we have a true enemy who hates us because of our position and our wealth in Christ. That's why Peter will tell us in 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom we may devour. And Jesus says in John 10, 10, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. Listen to me, child of God. The devil wants to keep you ignorant of your position and your wealth in Christ Jesus. He will fight to destabilize you and to keep you ignorant of who you are in the Lord and what you have in Christ. And so that you live like a pauper, you live like a slave, and yet you are free. You live like a servant, and yes, you are an heir. And so he will make you insecure in your position in Christ. You feel that you need to do more to please God. He will cause you to doubt God's wisdom and plan. You are not sure when God says this is the way things will be done. You are feeling, you feel like how sure am I? It will work out. It will cause, the devil will want you to live in perpetual fear. He is fighting your position to keep you ignorant. Because there is nothing he can do. We have been predestined to be heirs of the kingdom. Hallelujah. He can't change that. We have been predestined. It's already sealed. Our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And the heaven we are going. But you know, the Bible says in heaven, some people will enter by a whisker. And others will come in just smelling smoke. Yeah? And other people will come in and have no trophy, have no medal, have no... What are in gear to? But they are those who are in gear and they are in Kuna wale watapewa medals, having fought a good fight, having kept the fight. Paul says, I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. I have finished the race. 
When he was being threatened, going to Jerusalem, being told you will be killed or don't go, he says, none of these things move me as long as I finish my race. Oh, child of God listening to me. Please understand the devil wants you to be ignorant of who you are and what you have in Christ. Your position. You are seated in the heavenlies. That's what the Bible says. God has seated you with Christ in the heavenlies. You may be here, but you are not here. Don't live a life of being intimidated. A small thing happens. A cat passes outside your house. <gasps> Pastor, a demon. Please, you are seated in the heaven. katika china la Yesu. Hallelujah. Number two, Satan wants to keep you inconsistent in your walk. He wants, he is fighting to ensure that you don't walk according to your calling. To be inconsistent in your, in your work, your work. Such as being disobedient to God's word, involved in conflicts, living in sin, being hateful, bitter, unforgiving, gratifying the, the flesh. So the battle is within us and without us, in the church, in the family, between husbands and wives, between uh, parents and children, in the workplace and everywhere. People of God, nowhere to hide. The battle is everywhere. And that's why you need to understand that we are at war. There is a battle. Usiseme battle hiko kwa kina fulani peke yao. He is so subtle. When you think you are standing, the Bible says, take heed lest you fall. It's when you think you have everything together that the enemy strikes. But I want to give you, don't, lest you feel like Pastor Leo met but bad news. The good news is this. We are not fighting for victory. We are fighting from victory. Hallelujah! We are not fighting for victory, but we are fighting from victory. The battle is already won. Christ, by his dead and resurrection, he won the victory over the devil. So brethren, this is why we must be strong and courageous. And we must prepare for war. But the beauty of it all, we are on the winning side. I am a soldier in the army. I am a soldier in the army. I am a soldier in the army. I am a soldier in the army of Oh, I am a soldier in the army. I am a soldier in the army. I am a soldier in the army. I am a soldier in the army of the... Oh, if I die, let me die in the army. If I die, let me die in the army. If I die, let me die in the army. I am a soldier in the army of the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, Father, that you will help us to understand what this call means. The call to arms. May you grant, oh Lord, according to the prayer that Paul prays for the believer, that we may receive a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you. Lord, enlighten the eyes of our understanding so that we may know who we are in you, that we may know you are in investment in us, that we may know what you have called us to, the hope that you have called us to, O oh Lord, that we may know the power that works in us. Help us, dear Lord, that we may be strengthened with might in the inner man so that we may live a life that is worthy the call that we have received. 
pray that you may help us to understand that we have we are in battle we are at war we have a really enemy and as soldiers in the army of the lord we cannot afford to be casual we cannot be you cannot afford to sleep we cannot afford to be lazy because we live on a war zone we must be alert we must be dressed and prepared we must be properly equipped have all the ammunition necessary and we must be alert knowing who our enemy is we thank you and we bless you master in jesus name amen amen <laughs>